I, I get what you're saying, but I'm puzzled as to why, what, how would you explain the desire to change things? Is this all just mm. a mistake, or were there some good intentions here? Um, I, think, I think that the 20th century was a century of um, a great deal of catastrophe and of change in the world around us. And I think that that brought about um, a certain feverish desire for updating and adaptation according to whatever ideas people had, whatever they thought was going to work for modern man. Um, so it, it does seem to me that I don't know when it begins exactly. I'm, I'm not sure how far back to go. Maybe um, it, it's an enlightenment phenomenon. Maybe it's a 19th century phenomenon. But this idea that what was good for the former generation is not sufficient or adequate for us anymore, not relevant to us anymore, that, that has not been the attitude of most people most of the time during human history. Most of the time they want to keep what has been given to them and they think of it as more valuable because of, how, because of its age, its antiquity, its, its, um, the fact that you know, at least when I go into a church like tonight, when we had our votive mass in honor of St. Gregory, and I think to myself, there are many parts of this liturgy that St. Gregory the Great himself would have been celebrating. That really speaks to me powerfully. It makes me feel like I'm part of this giant mystical body that goes across 20 centuries, right? Um, but evidently in the 40s and 50s and 60s, there were people who thought this is a museum piece. This is like medieval play acting. Um, it's like a role playing game or something. You know, we, we need something quite different. Um, I don't know. You know, it seems to me that it would almost require a psychiatrist uh, to, to figure out what is the mentality of somebody who, who says we need to change things. Um, and, and I mean, by change, I mean big changes here. You know, little changes are natural in human life. You can change the cut of the priest's vestments over time. That's not, that doesn't, people don't recognize that as some kind of essential change, right? But, um, but the idea of, of let's make the Roman canon optional and bring and design a few more Eucharistic prayers, um, you know, with a committee, um, that's, that's a very strange thing. So basically, you were just a mistake. You, 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 validate, <laughs> you validate all of people saying we should change this you know what what you do yeah i i so i i've come to think more and more that the fundamental issue in the whole liturgical reform is rationalism and by that i mean they assume, and I'm read, I, read about, I read these people, I mean, it's a, it's a form of penance, but I read these people all the time because I'm very interested in knowing what they were thinking. And the one thing that every, lit, every liturgist took for granted is verbal, um, hearing words spoken out loud and verbally comprehending them is the only form of participation possible to people. There's, no, there's nothing else that matters. It, seeing the pageantry of, of liturgical ceremony in silence and with incense billowing into the air or with a chant in the background. Um, as far as they're concerned, it's like they were blind and deaf to those things. All they wanted to know was, could you hear word for word in your own language what, you know, what the priest was saying? Um, and that strikes me as, as pure rationalism, right? I and mean, that's something that Descartes would, would be proud of, right? It's, it's clear and distinct ideas you know, delivered to us in the vernacular. Um, and they, they never critique that idea. They just, they all share it. They all have it. Um, and now people look back and say, what were they thinking? I mean, we know now, even at the time, even in the 60s, there were already people saying um, human beings communicate in many subtle ways, right? Not just through audible vernacular words, right? So I, no, I do actually, I fault them for rationalism. I and mean, that seems to be a huge part of this. With regards to that last question, it's worth noting that I think that all these a lot of the early liturgical reformers and the modern ones as well lived in an era where low mass had become completely the norm. And if, you, if yeah. people's parish experience doesn't often include the experience of high mass, pageantry doesn't mean much to yes. them. Yes. Uh, and it's true of the Reformation as well, by the way. Yes. Um, you know, the, 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 the reformers all thought of low mass as the primitive form of the mass. Right. They were wrong. It's something much closer to pontifical high mass, kind of across mm -hmm. with an orthodox divine liturgy. Um, but that's what they thought, and that's the right to the reform Yes. And, and I, by the way, I mean, I, no, I agree with that completely. Um, the, the liturgical movement, generally speaking, they agreed that the high mass should be the norm. Um, I mean, you, you do have some outliers, 
like in, in the United States especially, there were people who wanted low mass with vernacular hymns. They thought that was what we should do. But most of the liturgical reformers that I'm aware of, um, they were advocating the full solemn mass with, with full ceremonial and with chant. Um, and in the early phase of the liturgical movement, somebody like Dom Baudouin uh, would have said, um, as long as the people have the possibility of understanding what the text of the Mass, not necessarily at that moment, but as long as they're being catechized and they're learning um, the prayers of the liturgy, then yes, let it all, let, let it be as splendid as possible with the chant and everything. It seems like later, as the liturgical movement progressed, um, a kind of pessimism crept in, whereby they thought, you know what, this is not really possible after all, and so we need to, to vastly simplify things. Everything has to be simplified. Um, and that's, that's the other thing I've noticed is in all of the changes that were made, it was always in the direction of abbreviating and simplifying and reducing, always. Nobody ever said, uh, you know, nobody ever said, maybe what modern people who are very utilitarian and reductionistic and activistic, maybe what they need is a more elaborate liturgy. <laughs> maybe they need more processions. Maybe they need more chant, you know? Um, nobody ever thought that, that upping the, the liturgy was the way to go. They all thought you had to sort of dumb it down, you know? And that, that's another one of these strange assumptions. Why would everybody have this assumption? You know? Yes? I just want to ask, to ask about um, Paul, the sixth, and the, I always thought of him as a great hero who, if you like, resisted the uh, pressures of uh, modern change and all that, and despite being advised to, do, uh, to change the rules of this very important area of uh, childbirth and everything, who stood up for those pressures. But now, you said something just now which suggested that at his time things began to, individualism mm -hmm. began to create. I mean, do you, are we playing in Pope Paul VI or? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of Pope Paul VI, except um, I certainly admire him for some things that he did, for sure. Um, Humane Vitae was absolutely the right thing for him to say at the time he said it. Um, however, the main problem with Paul VI is a psychological and political problem. He compared himself to Hamlet, and I think that that, that, that insight that he had into himself was exactly right. Because if you read his life, and there are many, many good biographies of his life, he was always giving with one hand and taking with the other. And, and he was going back and forth. And whoever, you know, if, if one pressure group came to him, he'd give them something. And then the opposite group would come and he'd give them something. So he was very, he was almost tormented, I would say, about what direction to go in. And as a result, he often ended up contradicting himself, which didn't help a church that was in a state of turmoil. So, for example, he personally said very clearly he wanted communion on the tongue, kneeling to remain the norm. But then when, when the Episcopal conferences applied pressure and said, we don't want that, we want communion in the hand standing, he, he let them have it, right? So it, it was really, I mean, that's a big problem from the point of view of papal governance when you, when you don't, you know, you, you, you keep going back and forth like this. So I think, I think with the liturgical reform, you know, sure, Pope Paul VI would have seen it as, I'm authorizing four or eight, or however many Eucharistic prayers, as opposed to the hundreds of illicit Eucharistic prayers that flourished in Europe in the 1960s. So he would see himself as really pulling back, right? I'm really pulling back. But from, from the opposite side, you could say, well, all the Western liturgies only ever had one Eucharistic prayer. That's very much our tradition. Why would you suddenly increase it to four or eight? That, that seems rather arbitrary. So, yeah. So it's a mixed bag. Yes. Oh, and so I know there's different ways of seeing the Second Vatican Council. You know, one as the council itself was okay, but then what happened after the council was, uh, you know, a tragedy. And other people would say, you know, the council itself was, you know, heretical in some ways. Mm -hmm. What What would you? Respond to? Oh, just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of Vatican II? Um, I know, I, what I think about Vatican II is um, very much shaped by Roberto Di Mattei. Sorry, what? Roberto Di Mattei is somebody who wrote a book called Vatican II, the, uh, an un unwritten story. It's, it's available in English um, as well as in the original Italian. But, uh, but what, 
Well, and Roberto de Mattei is, is a church historian, but he's just following in the footsteps of, of Wiltkin's The Rhine Flows of the Tiber, um, or Michael Davies' Pope John's Council as well, although de Mattei is more scholarly um, than those authors. But the, the basic outline to me seems to be that um, John the Twenty Third called the Council for laudable and defensible reasons, um, but didn't have a terribly clear plan of what he wanted, and then he died um, in the, right after the first session. Uh, and the other big problem was that there was truly a powerful liberal faction in the council, the so-called Rhine Group, that clearly maneuvered and took over early on and chucked out all the preparatory schemas and put all their favorite theologians into places of, of influence and essentially wrote their views into all the documents as much as they possibly could, although they had to um, prudently um, make sure that the novel ideas were always set within the context of more traditional sounding ideas. And so it, it does seem to me that what you end up with is, is you know, council documents that end up looking like you know, the map of Europe or Africa, like many different colors, many different states, and they're not all at peace with each other. You know, these are states in a, in a condition of war um, in many cases. Um, and, and you see that, I mean, there are some really obvious examples like Dignitatis Mane, where Paul VI inserted in the beginning, you know, this document doesn't change anything about the duties of nations and men to the true religion of Christ. And then the rest of the document seems to take away what the earlier popes had said about precisely that subject. So it, you see even within the documents these, these very tremendous tensions. And that I think just reflects what's going on in the council itself. So, um, so in the end, the problem is, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, there's this medieval saying, authority is a wax nose, you can twist it whichever way you want. Um, Vatican II can be you can quote all the traditional elements from it to prove your point, and then the person on the other side can quote all these other things that are ambivalent or ambiguous or whatever. And um, in the end, it, it, it ends up being, I think, not terribly helpful when you can do that to such an extent. Right? It's, it seems in that way very different from the Council of Trent or even the, the First Vatican Council where it says very clearly what it means to say and then it has a bunch of canons and anathemas that, <laughs> that make it absolutely... I mean, you, 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 there is so little room, wiggle room, in the Council of Trent um, because of how clearly written it is. And that seems to me, I would just say, an ecumenical council should strive for that kind of clarity. Otherwise, what's the point? Yes, Father. Um, I love your talk, and I agree with many of the problems you diagnosed. Uh, I've grown up with this. I was uh, born a year after the closing of the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. um, but the question I want to ask is, um, where did tradition go wrong in practice in the parishes? Because the issue is, it's probably slowly coming back, but um, the liberal faction you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. our president Conte, they all came from traditional backgrounds, ultimately, when they were, uh, the, the, in their young years. So, where did it go wrong in practice? Uh, this touched on the issue earlier, what was the motivation for the uh, powerful change and mm -hmm. almost an anger against tradition, which you see a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I, I, of course, as we go further in time, we're moving more and more away from a generation of whom you can say that. So it seems to me that some people have made the case that Pope Francis is truly the first Vatican II Pope in the sense that he was ordained in the, I think in 1970 and his formation took place in the 1960s when things were already fairly anarchical. Um, but you know, Pope Benedict XVI is a very definitely pre-Vatican II man, and so you can see that. And even even when he is at his most modern, he still sounds like somebody who's steeped in a tradition. That's Benedict I'm talking about. Um, but this much seems true to me that that um, Catholicism had become a kind of cultural convention in many parts of the world, and I think that that caused deep pain to people who took it quite seriously, intellectually and religiously. Um, and they, they wanted to know, how can we sort of wake people up and jumpstart them into taking possession of their faith in an active and personal way? And you can, you can see right away that somebody who thinks that is going to think active participation in the mass in the sense of like getting people to do things and, and say things and uh, stand up and sit down and you know, just like to do, do stuff. Um, they're going to think that that's the way to reanimate what is now a kind of culturally conventional, dormant faith. And the problem is that they were not smart enough to recognize that a cultural convention is a fragile thing. 
And when you make such a radical change, you're actually going to just fracture it all over the place. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the solution, I mean, it seems to me the solution was to patiently try to reawaken the faith in whatever way possible. And this was happening, like in the United States, there were tens of thousands of children learning how to sing Gregorian chant by something called the Ward Method. And this was happening all the way through the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s. At the Chicago Eucharistic Congress in 1926, I think it was, um, when a papal legate came uh, for the liturgies, they had something like 60,000 children singing the chant together. They had all been trained in their parochial schools, and then they all came together and they sang the same chants. Um, you know, the whole mass they sang. And so it seems to me that things like that could have been done more and more. And the, the problem was they wanted to find a silver bullet solution. They wanted to find a quick solution to this problem. And it just ended up sort of blowing everything up. <laughs> That's the best I could do. Yeah. Um, so an argument I heard recently that I thought was, was quite powerful was that um, the, the ordinary form of the mass um, might have a future as something like the, the, the missionary form of the mass. That... Um, <coughs> Uh, this was from a chap who had taken his father to Holy Mass in, in the extraordinary form. Uh, and his father was uh, an Anglican mm -hmm. and just felt completely lost. Uh, and he said, had I taken my father to a sort of reform of the reform, um, uh, ordinary form of Mass, um, he, he, he would have been able to sort of navigate his way through it. Mm -hmm. And so we need some sort of, sort of liturgical action where, where the baptized who, who, who are uh, separated, um, not in communion, may, may make their way into the fullness of, uh, of proper liturgical practice. Well, yeah, I mean, so, so one point that could be made is that it would certainly be cruel to do to everyone again what was done to people in the 1960s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. That is to say, I, I would. I can't imagine it ever being prudent for a pope to come along and simply replace the Novus Ordo with the uh, traditional Latin liturgy again. Just like that, you know, in a, in a, in a constitution that's going to happen in a month or six months. Or I, that, that wouldn't make sense. It would be much better to gradually increase the presence of the old liturgy and, and let it attract young generations, as it seems to be doing. Everywhere I go, I see that. Um, and, and, you know, let it be the case that maybe a parish now has one of each mass on a certain, or let's say it has two ordinary form, one extraordinary form masses, maybe let it over time become the other way around, two and one, you know, just kind of let, let, let people be um, nourished by what they need to be nourished with. Um, that, that just seems prudent to me. I mean, I don't, in a way I don't like it because I think it would be, it would have, it would be better for people to get used to a more traditional way of worshiping. But, um, but I, I can, I mean, I'm also a realist and I can see that that doesn't happen. Um, instantly, but the point about missionary liturgy, I mean, I think I'd want to be careful about that because I mean, you didn't perhaps have this idea. It seemed like you were talking about missionary within Western, you know, post-Christian yeah. Western civilization. Um, but we have to remember that the liturgy with which the old evangelization took place was the Tridentine liturgy, and the Church has never been more successful in all of her history with missions as she was during the Tridentine period. Right? And this is something people they don't take it seriously. Right? Um, in fact, I read this. One of the bishops at the Second Vatican Council who got up to make a speech, and those speeches are fascinating to read, the speeches of the bishops at the council. Um, one of them got up and he said, this was during the liturgy debate um, in the fall of 1962. He said, I just want to remind everybody that if we start multiplying the number of liturgical books that we have to print, Missionaries are not going to be able to carry them around with them anymore. <laughs> this is right now we have everything in one missile, and I can keep, I can carry that with me, you know. But if you start having lectionaries and books of psalms and you know all these things that people were talking about, uh, it's that's going to fall apart. So even even a practical thought like that. <laughs> yes, uh, question go back to the Roman canon. Um, the last time it was changed in 1962, when Pope John XXIII added St. Joseph to the list. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little about that and why it was done? Or why yes. it been omitted for that long? And, oh my goodness, yeah, uh, that's another question. What, what's your thought about it? Okay, so here's my brief thought. If I guess. Um, it, 
Apparently, the idea of inserting the name of St. Of course, the devotion to St. Joseph has grown hugely since about the 16th century, mainly. Um, St. Teresa, Jesus, very devoted to St. Joseph, um, and many other great saints, too. Um, apparently, the idea of inserting the name of Joseph into the canon arose first under the reign of Pius IX in the late 19th century, or, well, actually, I guess that would be sort of middle of the 19th century. Um, and I've heard this said by somebody I trust. Well, Cardinal Burke told this story. Um, but I, I tried to find the source for it. I couldn't find it. So if anybody can tell me the source, I'd love it. But there's a story that someone approached Pius IX and said, could you please insert the name of St. Joseph to the canon? And he said, well, I can't do that. I'm just the pope. <laughs> um, now, whether that's apocryphal or true, it kind of illustrates the attitude that I was getting out of my paper, which is you don't just go adding saints to the Roman canon. I mean, we haven't done that since 604, right? <laughs> this is not something we do. Um, but that idea of adding the name of Joseph kept coming up again and again. Apparently, it came up throughout the 20th century at certain times. People would, add, people would petition Rome for that, and they'd always say no. Um, and then it came up again, a huge number of bishops, I don't know how many, maybe somebody knows, but I think it was hundreds of bishops asked um, John the 23rd to, to insert the name of Joseph, and then he did because he himself was deeply devoted to St. Joseph. Um, but here's the problem. I actually think it was a bad idea. I, I mean, I love St. Joseph, I pray to St. Joseph, but for all the reasons I gave in my paper, I think it's best, as Bernard Bott says, not to have any ages own devotional life unduly influence the public prayer of the church. And I think what you see with John the 23rd is a dear old man with a devotion to Joseph who decides that he can, because of that, he can put this name into the venerable Roman canon. And in, when that happened in 1962, the, the liberals, the progressives, the, the people, the kind of people who were gonna be on the concilium later on, um, they saw that as a major event, major event. We don't see it that way now, but when they saw it, they said the dam has been cracked, right? If, that, if, this can, if one change can happen, any change can happen. They saw it that way. So. Yes. Um, yeah. um, there is a Latin text for the novel sort of, yes. uh, minus sort of bilingual. Is there any legal reason why um, priests should not say the novel sort of in Latin, or indeed um, move from Latin to English and English to Latin and back again in the course of saying the mass? Well, no. I mean, there's no legal reason that. Let me let me start over. Um, every. The Code of Canon Law says now, the new Code of Canon Law, 1983, says that the liturgy is to be celebrated in Latin or in another approved language. So every priest anywhere can celebrate the liturgy in Latin, the new liturgy. Um, unfortunately, well, there are two problems with that. One is that people get in trouble for doing that. Um, that is to say, you're allowed to celebrate Mass in Latin. You're allowed to celebrate Ad Orientem. All these things are allowed because they're there in the rubrics. But... Um, allowed isn't always allowed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, and, and actually, it, it can be easier for a priest to introduce Latin via the traditional Latin mass, because everybody, as that very name, which is a bit of a misnomer, suggests, people just assume that the old liturgy has to be in Latin. So it's not even really controversial, because you can't do it in the vernacular. It has to be in Latin. But because the Novus Order can be done in the vernacular, to do it in Latin is a kind of a statement. You're making a statement, like you're anti-vernacular or something like that. Um, the other problem is something that, that has been pointed out um, in, a, in a number of um, places, that people have certain expectations when they go to the Novus Ordo. They expect to be able to understand without the use of a book in, in most cases. Um, and, that's not, and, and so if suddenly a priest starts bringing in Latin, people will be frustrated because it's, contrary to, it's con counter to their expe expectations. Whereas if you go to a... Um, a, a mass in the traditional Roman rite, you're expecting it to be in Latin, and so people kind of prepare themselves. They get a red booklet or they get a missile or something like that, right? So I guess I'm saying that there are kind of pragmatic reasons perhaps not to do that. But, um, but I'm not opposed to it in, in, in principle. So, um, um, oh, in the back. No, the very back. back. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so one of the one of the criticisms that's been made um, of um, bringing the extraordinary form as an option is that it could lead to a kind of a liturgical anarchy, um, mm -hmm. um, and I always see that there's a, there's almost sometimes a mirror image of that argument made that um, that you know that again having a having the new the new mass with a variety of different options again is led to this sort of liturgical anarchy, and what I've seen very rarely is is, um, is uh, dealing with the fact that we have, you know, valid other rites within the Catholic Church. Most, you know, the, the, the um, ancient one, of course, being the Eastern rite, 
and now the Anglican writes mm -hmm. as well that have um, been brought across. And I'd be really interested, I just haven't seen that dealt with um, mm -hmm. by traditionalists. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, with that tension. I think if you read, if you read enough um, of, what, of what traditionally minded people are saying, they definitely are saying, we're all in favor of a pluralism of liturgies, but what we want is a pluralism of ancient liturgies, not a pluralism of fabricated liturgies, right? That, that is, we don't want like the children's liturgy where they dress up in a certain way. Like, that, that kind of made up stuff is not part of our liturgical heritage and it actually ends up backfiring. It doesn't really serve the purpose that it was designed to serve anyway. Um, so yes, I love you know the, the Byzantine liturgy. I, I'm very familiar with the Byzantine liturgy and I love it. It's beautiful. Um, and I think you know the more the merrier as far as that goes. Um, but uh, but as far as, I mean, anarchy is concerned, I mean, we've, we're in anarchy. That's the condition that things are in right now. So adding, like, adding, like, a nice option to the anarchy seems to me to be going in the right direction. Uh, so in, in that sense, I, I guess I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't see that we're going to cause any harm by doing that. So let me repeat because we've run out of time now. Okay. Well, why don't you ask it in four minutes? Yes. I, I will, um, I'll, I'll come back to, in, into the back of the room if anybody's interested in having me sign. But thank you very much for attending.